with the sort of perspective of wanting to improve practice uh, and to disseminate good um, good practice and good ideas, I'm really keen to do this, and I've also really benefited from people coming to York to do something similar, and with the sort of spirit of being open and uh, discussing what works and what doesn't in, in a way of trying to get things um, get, getting things better for all, if, if you like. So, so what I would say is that this is my personal opinion of things that I think work to you all. And I, I guess one of the things that we've sort of discovered from talking to other institutions is that every institution is different in its own special way and has different, um, different stresses, different um, challenges, and perhaps has different ways of working, which might be to do with the way in which the university is set up. It might be something to do with the way it's managed that means that things operate in a different way. Or it may just be something uh, more to do with the different challenges that come about because of uh, different students and staff and, and uh, activities that, that you do. So this is this is essentially what we do at York. Um, and whether it's good for other, other universities or other departments or whatever, I, I don't know, just find out through, um, through discussion. So the first thing I would say is that we've been on this path for a very long time. So, so one, the one thing I think for everybody to appreciate is that it took us a long time to get to gold. It's not something that happens very quickly. So uh, when I arrived in New York in 2001, um, there was clearly already interest in issues to do with, with gender, and that had been, uh, I think that was probably due to certain specific people within the university wanting to engage with the process. And then in 2006, when applying for the Athena Swan was a fairly straightforward thing to do, I think it's just two, two sides of text where you could choose whether you wanted to include data or not. It was sort of up to you. Um, we, biology at York got a silver at that point. So from 2006 up until 2014, uh, when we got our gold, we have been doing a lot of different things and starting from quite a good place, but it has been a long a long trip, if you like, and we did try for gold before we were successful, so that's the other thing, like a lot of other departments, they're trying, if they're at a bronze, they're trying for silver, and if they're silver, they're trying to get to a gold. So I suppose what I would say is it's taken us a long time and we weren't successful, it took us a few goes to get to get to gold. So, so uh, as you'll see at the very end, I, one of the things I think is quite important is about continuing to make progress, because clearly we, we're not only doing all of this just to get an award, although that's a nice prize at the end of it, we are wanting to do this so that um, we have better working conditions for, for, for all. Um, so my role in the department, I, I'm um, uh, an ecologist, so um, I've been at the uh, University of York for most of my professional life. I got my first uh, lectureship there and have been promoted and now have a chair. So I've seen quite a lot of the good practices that have been in place and perhaps I may have benefited from, from some of those. But my perspective as a lecturer is all from, from York. I have other experiences from being postdocs and an undergraduate elsewhere. I have several roles in the department, but my main admin role is to be uh, the Athena Swan champion. So I was responsible for putting in our gold applications, for getting our silver renewal, and then subsequently for getting our successful gold. Um, I still call myself the Athena Swan Champion, but I've now moved into an equality and diversity champion as we're all moving away directly from Athena and women's science, much more into equality and diversity, recognising what the ECU is doing. So that's only just happened, so I'm still not quite aware of how my role is changing, and, that, and maybe that's something we could discuss because clearly everybody's going through that process and no one's quite clear about how how these things will change. So, that, so that's just um, who I am and what, and what we've been doing. Uh, so this is the Department of Biology at, at York. So this is, this is who we are. That's not the university. That's a, on one of our research away days um, so that we don't have nice buildings uh, like that. Um, and most of what we've done, and this is what uh, I think is perhaps unique to us, and I don't think other departments have done this, is essentially our philosophy is about bad working practicing, bad working practices detrimentally affecting women, but good practices affect, uh, are good for all. So everything we do is inclusive. So we we have managed to get gold without doing any particular activity that is only for women. 
So we haven't badged anything as a woman's activity. And and I I don't know whether that was the right thing to do. I, I don't know, I, I, I know other places do it differently. I also know that the university does it differently. So for instance, we have a woman's forum at the university, which clearly is for women only. But within the department, we have never done anything for women. We've just looked at activities and felt that they were bad practices and therefore they needed to be improved. So I'm not saying that that's what everybody should be doing. I'm just saying that if you want to think about how, how we've approached it at York, that's always been our, our philosophy. And I know some people might think that that probably is not going to be effective. They might think that we should be targeting specific activities to women maybe. But one thing I would say is that we've managed to keep all of the staff on board, more or less, as a consequence. So I read, well, maybe people would come and say it to me, but I rarely hear people who think that a female swan is a bad thing, either men or women, either feeling that they're being patronised or feeling that there's activities happening that they just don't support. And I don't know how much of it is because we tell everybody this is our philosophy, and therefore they shouldn't expect to see women's things happening. Or, or, or not, but that's just how we run everything. So whenever we want to make a change, we just play it out for everybody and just say everybody is going to benefit because this was a bad way of doing it in the past and now we think it is a much better way of doing it in the future. But of course all of our data analysis and all of the actions that we take are all looking at things from a gender perspective. So we do know situations where, where men or women are, are, are disproportionately affected and those are the things that we're picking up to Im improve upon. Um, so of course we are looking at we are looking at gender. Um, so this is uh, myself and uh, Nina Pirojek on the right there. So Nina is our biology HR manager. Um, so all of our Athena activities in the department are co-run by academics and by HR. So there are quite a few things where HR needs to be involved to actually roll out activities but we also have a lot of academic input, so we make sure that all of the things that people want to do are of benefit to uh, academics as well. So it's very much a joint run, run thing. So, so say both Nina and I work quite closely together to, um, to roll out our activities. So this is us looking so pleased, you can believe all these, so we've eventually managed to get it, and that's Julia Higgins who was, hands out the awards and was the person who set up the Athena Forum. Uh, originally. <coughs> okay, so I haven't put too many data in here, <laughs> um, but I just thought that this would be a useful point to start with because clearly collecting the data and reflecting on the data is a huge part of what, of what we do. And over the years we've gradually been collecting more and more data and we've been having more and more discussions around the data as we, as we collect it. So, so part of the reason I think that the Athena journey takes such a long time is that the actual process of collecting information is clearly a big job, but also the discussion around that, about what it's showing you and what are the particular challenges for your department or your institute, is... Um, it takes a long time, it takes a lot of consultation with staff and decisions about what we might wish to do about it. Um, so this is, uh, this, is, this, this is taken from our gold application which went in, in 2013. So it's a couple of years um, out of date, um, but not, not hugely. So. So this is the sort of, this is what they call about, this is the leaky pipeline that they talk about. So for a, for a biology department, for undergraduates, we're fairly typical. It's actually come down a little bit. We've introduced some new, uh, a new degree programme in biomedical sciences and we're also starting a new degree programme in natural sciences. So we're keeping an eye on this to see whether that 60% starts to drop or not. Um, <coughs> but we're about, this is about where most, I think most biology departments are. Yeah. yeah so what's so what's changed here recently? So so these these are, these are quite small numbers, and so what's happened recently is this has swapped, and quite a few of our lecturers now have become promoted to senior 
lecturer, and we've actually now got a dearth of female lecturers because we've promoted but not recruited. Um, our, our, uh, ov overall, we're just under 30% female overall across all of the uh, academics. And uh, yeah, that makes us slightly above the Russell. We compare ourselves with the Russell Group. That makes us above the, the Russell Group. So, so we spend quite a lot of our time focusing on this transition, which is, so, so these, are, these are the postdocs and the senior researchers, and these are the uh, um, permanent, if you like, lecturers. So it's this transition that we've been most, most interested in. And our, uh, um, um, what we've been told does make us quite unique at York is the fact that this is relatively flat. So we don't seem to have the continued, as I say, these, these, these numbers are a bit small, but we don't seem to have the continued reduction down to a, a professorial level. So, um, so what we conclude at York, at York Biology is once you're in, you're okay if you're a woman. But getting in in the first place is what's what's hard, um, and it's not as though we're recruiting women in as lecturers and they're never being promoted, which I think is what you're seeing in some other institutes. So, so although we have, as I'll, as I'll show you, we have spent quite a lot of time looking at our promotions procedures, we've been focusing quite a lot at this recruitment into the lectureship because we think that that's where most of the uh, most of the issues most issues are. So, so the other thing that we've also talked about quite a lot as a department is where would we wish to be? <laughs> and that's quite an interesting discussion to have and it's not being resolved. So if, if somebody could sort of wave their magic wand, what would this graph look like if everything was completely fair? And I don't think, most people don't think that it would be 50% across the board. And I, 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 that might be an interesting discussion to have. I, I, I think in the department we don't think that that probably would be the case. And this is sort of getting people into thinking about quotas and things like that. That's sort of where that discussion starts to go. So if it was all completely free and everything was completely fair, what, what would the graph look like? Would it actually look like 60% across the board because that's what's coming in at undergraduate level? Or do you not actually peg it at your undergraduates because perhaps you would expect your undergraduates to be 50-50? Perhaps we should be turning female students away. Do you see, I mean, that's a sort of interesting discussion to be had about all of this, because I think if you were in a, well, if you, if you saw this graph for the chemistry department at York, who is also a gold award, then they have a much flatter uh, um, set of histograms showing far less of a, a leaky pipeline, but everything's pegged at about 25%, and they put a lot of effort into getting more female undergraduates coming in, because it's the male dominated all across the board. So anyway, so it's quite, a, that, that's an interesting sort of discussion to have, because that's part of that. That's, I think that's what Athena wants us to be thinking about. Where would, it, where would you be if everything was fantastic? And what are you, where are you hoping to be as you're putting in all of your new <laughs> ideas? So that if you, have, if you have a target and a goal, you'll know when you've got there. Okay, so w there's a bit of... Uh, this, again, is taken from the sorts of data that, um, that Athena asks for. So this is looking at... Um, who applies? So this is the question you just you just asked. What is the proportion of your applicants that are female? What proportion of your applicants do you actually interview? And then how many do you appoint? And as you can see here, the numbers are, are of course really really small. Um, <coughs> and we haven't uh, we we sort we're sort of over this time we're sort of as you can see appointing about two people, one or two people a year. So we're not really expanding, but there have been some new degrees that we're offering. So there's a bit of expansion here, but mostly turnover. But there's very few opportunities when you can actually really change very much because it's such a... Um, uh, <laughs> uh, there's so few, there, there's so few uh, appointments being made. But the sorts of things that we're looking at here is the question that you, you said about why so few women apply. Mm. So, so the numbers... Uh, we would be expecting, if the people who are applying are essentially the postdocs, for which we've got 50%, more or less, why isn't the number of women applying for academic places about 50%? So all of these pale green bars should really be 50%, I think. So they're already getting a bit, a bit low. So this, so out of the, so we get, so in this case, in 2008, 30% of the applicants were female and just under 30% were interviewed and we ended up with um, uh, uh, 
two appointments, of which one was a woman. That's how you um, read those. So, so what the sorts of things that's um, quite interesting is that there isn't really a pattern between a percentage um, applying and being interviewed. The university thinks that women are more likely to be interviewed, that, and they think that that's an indication that women are applying at a much later stage, being less risk averse in terms of applications. So just a, it's just sort of jumping around uh, um, quite a bit, quite a bit there. But we have spent a lot of effort thinking about how to make adverts and the application process uh, more uh, family friendly. <coughs> so this would be the way of putting it. So really making our logo, you can see the swan very evident, and all of our uh, practices that we think are family friendly very evident. Uh, but, but we haven't really solved the problem about how you get more women to apply and I think lots of places are trying to address this issue because lots of places have picked up that you could only appoint women if they apply and if they're not applying then you've already, you're already got a reduced um, uh, number of cohort of them. Yeah, but anyway these are the sorts of things that we mull over and look at a lot and talk with our university HR about ways of making the uh, recruitment uh, process um, better and we brought in, a, I'll, I'll talk about it at the end actually because we brought in a few different ways of recruiting um, which which we think is probably quite be a good practice which I'll talk about um, uh, in a moment. Anyway so, so these are the more up to date data so these are different to what's in our gold application and this is what I was mentioning so now we're going back to looking at uh, uh, female staff by grade, but this time over the different years. So this is this is um, degrading the data and splitting it. So this is our Russell group that we compare against. And as you can see, it sort of started off quite well in 2008 with nice, even um, uh, lecturers, senior lecturers, readers, and professors. <coughs> and then when we got our gold, it was back to that sort of possession again. And as I say now, we've, we've sort of got a disparity. Um, and some of this is to do with people arriving and leaving, some of it is to do with people being promoted. And it's a whole mixture of, a mixture of things. But we're keeping an eye on this because we've appointed quite a lot of male lecturers recently. Um, so, so not that many, but they just doesn't take long for it to change to a slightly different pattern. And then we've got promotions going through but not replacing women coming, coming through. Um, and as you can see, the black line on the top is just the total number of staff, so a slight increase in the number of staff ov overall. So, so we keep a good look at, look at this all, all of the time, and this is really where we want, this is the sort of pattern that we want to see, where we want to see equal, num no drop-off across the different grades, but of course we'd like to see it above 30%. That's the um, sorts of things we want to do. Uh, but we did see between 2008 and uh, 2014 there has been uh, an, a slight increase in the proportion of female lecturers overall. We've gone from 25% to nearly 29%. <laughs> so slowly heading in the right direction, but very, very slowly. So I sort of had a bit of a think about why I thought we'd got gold, because it is a bit difficult. It's a sort of very difficult to pin down some of these awards. You know, what do you actually have to do to get bronze? What do you have to do to get silver? They're not too bad. They're, they're quite the, the sort of rules, if you like, are, are reasonably clearly laid out for those. And then you sort of think, what do you have to do to be gold? We, we were quite sure. So I tried to reflect what it was that I thought we'd done that made us uh, uh, unique. Um, so one of the things I did think, even though it was a slight increase, the fact that we did increase the female representation in the department, I think that must have helped us, even if it was only by a very small amount. Um, so um, so we, we've increased the uh, number of female professors we've got, we recruited some, we lost some, and we also promoted some. So there was a mixture of reasons why the number increased. Uh, and over the silver period, so that's, uh, that was up to 2013, we had increased the number of female lecturers. But as I say, that number has now changed because some of those lecturers have now gone to become senior lecturers. So those, those numbers are a bit different. 
Anyway, you see, you've been fiddling around with those numbers forever, and, and there's always there's always something going on that's um, quite interesting. Um, embedding the Theno principles into the department, that took ever such a long time to do. Um, and the, one of the reasons why I think we were quite successful is that the department has dedicated resource to this. So that's actual money, and I always think unless there's real money involved, it means that the department doesn't really support something. So the evidence of how, the evidence of how much what you're doing is supported by the university and the department, I always look into the money, and there is some money for this, so that I always think that's a good thing. And we also have part-time uh, part use of uh, one of our um, departmental administrators to help us with it. And that's really important because they do a lot of the day-to-day -day collecting of information and, and organising uh, meetings, writing up minutes and so on and so forth. The SAT is the self-assessment team. We increased that over the years on advice. We used to have quite a small group of people that were really dedicated and had volunteered to do Athena Swan, which was great. But we decided we don't run any other meetings like that. We don't just get a small group of people who'd like to come along to a teaching meeting to run all of our teaching. So why would we do Athena like that? So we now have a much larger group of people who are there because of the roles they hold in other parts of the department. We have terms of reference for why they're there. So, so you're there because of the other role you have, not just because you're really enthused about Athena Swan activities. And that means that not only do we get greater um, 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 influence throughout the department, you can also ask for spe specific people to do things, and it's their responsibility to do things, rather than rely on a few people who are just enthusiastic but a little bit too busy to do anything. So it's now run just like any other committee in the, uh, in the department uh, would, would, would run. We also built a website, and I know that sounds really trivial, but you know, with all of these things it's just getting them done and getting them populated and keeping them up to date. And we also, because of the way in which we were driving the Athena process from the biology department, um, we were chipping the university to get their data records into the state that we could use. And I think by being one of the first departments to need these data, we were always having to go and tell them to improve their processes to get the data. And of course all the departments that are coming on behind us now, they just have all the data available for them because the, the central data repositories now know that this is what we need. So when we first started to do Athena, things like student records weren't all centralised. Um, things like the, you know, the, the HR recruitment software wasn't doing what we wanted and has subsequently been changed. The, you know, the, the, the ways in which all of the staff data was centrally held is now easily, um, it's easy for us to query and to get the data. When we first started, we had to do this all by sort of phoning people up and just finding paper records and stuff. So, so things have improved. So, so we go to Net Athena network meetings fairly regularly. So we have a northern network that was arranged a few years ago at a time when lots of groups were trying to get together and working out the best way of sharing information. And then we felt that they didn't want to go to London to meet up because Athena used to, ECU used to organise in London. So we now have a northern one, which is essentially the M62 up to Newcastle, meet up along, somewhere along the M62 or A1. So, so we had to pay to go to those meetings. Uh, so what do we do? Yeah, so at one of the meetings I went to, I discovered that our promotions process in the biology department was pretty ropey. Um, this was separate from the promotions criteria that the university set out. So of course we don't set the criteria, they're set by the university. Our actual process, I realised, was not very good. And I talked to other uh, universities and realised that they were operating in a, in a way that was considered much better from an HR perspective. We just didn't, didn't know about it. So what we had done was that actually if you talked to most staff, they thought it, there was a black art to getting promoted where somehow you had to apply several times and then if the moon was right then you were lucky on the third occasion. And it, was all a bit, it was all a bit weird and that, um, and that even if you had read the promotions criteria on the, on the university website, that clearly wasn't, wasn't it because it was all down to whether you just got a large grant or not. Or, or I, I don't know, there was some lots, of, lots of things going around. And, and also people feeling that, they, that um, they would be told when it was the right time for them to apply and that, that somehow they would, they, would, they would wait until that had happened. Anyway, so there was lots of confusion. 
And what I realised from talking elsewhere was that actually what most other places were running was the expectation that you went in for promotion every year and that that was the, that was the norm and that you would, would withdraw yourself from the promotion process under a, a number of reasons that you might choose not to go ahead. Whereas what we were doing was that very few people were going for promotion in any one year rather than large numbers of people going for promotion. So that's, we've changed that. And now we're much more proactive about encouraging people to go forward um, and that it's built in now to our performance management process. So every year at our performance um, review, the question is about whether or not we're going to go for promotion and a discussion about that. And then the head of department and the chair of the research committee um, then look over uh, those documents to see who they might choose to encourage to go forward if they didn't go forward themselves. So there's a mixture of expecting people to go forward more often and also making sure that those people who are ready to go forward are really encouraged to go forward. And then there's help with sort of lunchtime sessions and, and providing with a mentor if people find that that would be, be helpful. So, so I, won't go, I won't show you the, the data, but we've continued to be successful, but we've had many more people going forward for promotion, which sort of implied to us that we had quite a lot of people who were, who were ready for promotion but hadn't gone forward because of our old, our old process. Uh, and, and what I would say is that it's a huge amount of work. Um, and we're struggling with how we deal with that, especially the head of department is, wants to know how they can run it better because it is a huge amount of work. Not only talking to people, but also write, writing the supportive documentation for promotion is a huge amount of work. So we're continuing to think about this so that we can, in a way that is appropriate, try and distribute some of this effort across other senior members of the, of the department. Um, we didn't have a sabbatical process, we now do, and that was relatively easy to do. I thought it was going to be a nightmare to organise, but it was really quite straightforward. Or, the staff either said, we are very supportive of this, or said, I'm not really interested, I won't take part in it, but I don't, I'm, I don't mind if you would like to organise it, because it's not going to affect me. There are a few people who, who just said, I, I, I think the organisation of it is going to be quite difficult, and so therefore I'm not really interested. But most people just thought it was a great idea. And uh, we have this expectation that you have a term off every nine terms and that you will particularly go for, have, be, have a sabbatical if you return from an extended period of leave through sickness or from maternity leave. So that's been very easy to do. Um, oh, and we also used it during our ref, uh, the run-up to the ref as well. So it was quite a good flexible thing that pe people who needed some time to... Uh, um, for whatever it would be, whether it was to write a paper, whether it was to do some research, whether it was to go away, or just stay in York, whatever it was, it was it, people felt that it was a really good thing to do. The, the rhythm of the year in York happens a long time before the teaching. So you have to have put in your application for a sabbatical about a year before the year in which you wish to take your sabbatical. Because that's the time when the timetables are being agreed. Um, and so at the point at which the timetable has to have a different member of staff associated with it is at the time when you're thinking about your teaching for the following year. So, so it's, it's between a year and 18 months before you choose to take the sabbatical that you fill in the form requesting the sabbatical, mm -hmm. for which it's a very short form, but you just have to say what you're going to do and why you wish to have the sabbatical. And then within that, you list all of your activities that you will do and then how they will be covered. You make your suggestions as to who might do your teaching, what you're going to do about your PhD students, what you're going to do about your research lab, and so on and so forth. And then there's plenty of time to discuss what the arrangements might be. And one of the things we haven't done yet, but I just wonder, a bit sort of like babysitting points, you could sort of get points that you would gain from covering somebody else's sabbatical that you would then use to trade in when you got your sabbatical. Yeah, so, so you rely on the goodwill of your colleagues to cover for you, but the idea is that you do that quite happily because in nine terms' time you will be doing the same and you will require your staff. So it, it has to have the support of staff. And that's where, as I say, those staff who say, I don't want to get involved, they just say, I'm never going to take a sabbatical and I'm not going to cover for anybody else. And as long as you don't have too many people like that, you can, you can deal with that. 
And, and what we have done is that if you came back, say, from maternity leave, the expectation would be you would straight <coughs> away go on a sabbatical. I mean, we don't, I mean, not if you don't want to, obviously, but most people would be quite happy with that. And we've got a new workload model. Um, anyway, it, 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 that'll carry on, that, that's going to carry on evolving over time, but, but it used to just be an Excel spreadsheet, and now it's a little bit more sophisticated than that. But we've always had a complete transparency <laughs> about workload. So everybody, uh, this is primarily teaching, so everybody can see how much teaching everybody else is doing. So we have, we have spreadsheets with everybody's names and everybody's activities. So that we've always been quite transparent about that at, at, at York. Um, and now, and everybody is very happy with how we do that, but there's lots of discussions about how you actually tot up hours for particular activities. Um, we try to stay away from the marking. <laughs> what we do do is tot up the number of hours that your name is against on the central timetable. And that includes, um, uh, so that inc and that is weighted differently for first year, second year, and third year, reflecting that your first year is easier to deal with, but is a larger number, whereas your final year is a smaller cohort, but requires a lot more input because of the, the, the level of teaching that, that we're doing. So, so there is a, so you get more credit for teaching a third year module than you would for a first year module. It also has things about being on postgraduate training panels and it also has how many PhDs sorry, how many PhD students you have as well. It doesn't cover how many scripts cross your desk because <laughs> nobody could decide on a so if you marked a first year module with two hundred scripts that you just had to put a yes no on how would you separate that from 30 essays that were each a, a, almost a dissertation that was going to take you nearly an hour to do each essay? So we, we, we gave up on that discussion. So that we're moving towards what else should go on there. And I know some, uni some universities have a complete breakdown of how many papers you've written that year, how much money you've brought in, how many outreach activities you've done, and all of those things. We've, we've not gone there yet. But that we could do. And there's our website. Um, we we need somebody to keep it updated. So so we so we keep on. We, we manage to put something up here every week of somebody in the department who's female doing something. Um, we have all of our documents that can be downloaded, and I'll show you some of the documents and the analysis we do. We also have our case studies and some various other bits of information. So um, so what have we done? We spent quite a lot of time. We spent a lot of time surveying people. So we got some questions from the Wise website, and just used those. So this is what you would call a culture survey. I don't know if you've done this. Um, this is basically the only way that you really find out what your staff are thinking. So we've surveyed um, our second year students three years ago. Our staff two years ago, and we've just surveyed our PhD students. So we essentially asked them the same questions, so we want to find out how they perceive the department. We, the university, of course, is also running their own surveys at this time, and the, and the students are getting surveyed as well. So we try not to bombard them too, too much, and we let them know that this is specifically <coughs> for the biology department, and that they, they, they badge, we badge this survey very much that we're wanting to find out about them. So we get quite good uh, response rate. We did, we did um, uh, bribe them with free biscuits. So <laughs> <laughs> we got quite good response. Work. <laughs> yeah. Worked quite well for staff as well, so that was all okay. Um, and, then say, and then we use these to inform our, our decision. So for instance, it does tell us some slightly worrying things about those members of staff and students who, who say that they've been bullied or they've experienced times when they felt uncomfortable because of their gender. Uh, and, and those sorts of things that most of us perhaps weren't aware of. Now it's to then quantify and then think about how we're going to deal to deal with it. It also raised some quite interesting differences between male and female students about their attitude to their university and their career, which we hadn't quite appreciated. And it was evident <coughs> that even second year female students had already decided that a biology career was not for them. 
which which was quite which was quite interesting. So so it started to explain why there was this drop off at quite an early stage because they'd already perceived that they didn't want to become academics, which was quite which is quite interesting. So we do quite a lot of this. I don't use SurveyMonkey anymore. Um, we use we because we have undergraduate students who are much more savvy with this sort of thing on our Athena Swan team, they set this up in Google Forms and they told me it's very easy to do. And, and so they, they, just take the, they just take the questions and just run it in Google Forms and you don't have to pay and it's all there in an Excel spreadsheet for analysis. So it's very straightforward to do. And our idea is that we're going to be uh, regularly, perhaps every two or three years, repeating these surveys, hopefully to find improvements. Because one of the things that Athena Swan asks you for is evidence of improvement. And unless you quantify things, it's very difficult to show that things have improved. Um, and so that's part of the reason why we do this. Um, so one of the things we, we do a lot, which is what we call a gender audit. So we have lots of people looking out to make sure that everything we do has positive images on women for women. In fact, in some point, somebody pointed out to me recently that we think we've perhaps gone a little bit too far, and it was difficult to find a male undergraduate student in some of our documentation. So we've realised that we need to have a complete gender audit. In other words, not just looking for positive women images of women, but to make sure it's 50-50. And by that we mean we, we, we have people, the more people who are involved with spotting this sort of thing when it goes wrong, the better. So you can't just leave it up to one person, but we do that quite a lot just to make sure there are always lots of um, positive, positive images. So we've done lots of additional data analyses over and beyond what Athena asks us for. And this is to, again, pick up new initiatives. And I think this perhaps is also what got us gold, is that we were going way beyond what was being asked for. So what sorts of things do we check? Well, we look to see whether there's equal, um, not equal, the, 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 the number of females putting in for grants is what you'd expect given the proportion of women academics and whether they're equally, as, and whether they are as successful as they should be for the proportion of grants they're putting in. We, are, we were worried that we had more female students getting first class degrees and more males getting third class degrees. So we wanted to check that our teaching was fair to both male and female students. Of course, we looked to see whether our ref return in terms of gender was what you would expect for the females in the department. Uh, recently, the university provided me with data so I could look at a pay gap analysis. So that's our pay gap analysis, which I did uh, last month and then have shown to staff so that they can think about why that may, may be. So if this is everything from professor down to support staff, and Boxing Bray is where I found some ECU benchmarking um, data. So if the bar is above the line, men get paid more, and if it's below the line, women get paid more. Um, and we would have no reason, I think, from the outset to expect there to be any deviation from between men, men and women because of the um, spine points and, and and so on. Uh, we also, I also did analysis of age at promotion. I got those data as well to see whether you were older when you got promoted or you spent longer in your previous grade before you got promoted, those sorts of things. And then if there is any evidence of that, then you can target that in terms of things about promotions. And that, this is an interesting one. Do, do our students value our male and female lecturers equally? <laughs> or our, and, and, and what I'm trying to do at the moment is get our feedback forms changed so I can find out whether male and female students feedback equally and are equally positive. But there are lots of things like this where the information is not recorded by gender, so you need to get it changed by gender and then collect the data and then find out what's going on. So, so one of the things we're going to do with this pay gap data is have a discussion about where these differences might come from. Uh, okay, so this is going how we're going to keep gold. So we've got lots of things, more things that we're going to do. Um, and some of these we've got targets for, and some of these are, uh, are aspirational, and some of these we've got particular activities that we'll keep a, a check on so that we, we know whether we're heading in the right direction. Uh, or not. Somebody gave me the analogy of Sisyphus pushing a big stone, big rock up a hill and if you don't keep on pushing it rolls back and I think that's quite a good analogy. <laughs> so, so there's lots of things where you just can't stop doing things because otherwise you just go back to your old, your old ways. 
So the sorts of things that we're going to do uh, is carry on um, doing much more with Athena to the department. So, for instance, it becomes a standing item on our um, termly academic staff meetings, and I now have this thing where I have a statistic of the day where I go along to the meeting every term and I say, here's some more statistics with a gender uh, initiative for people to talk about, just to keep raising the profile and just getting people to, to think about where gender may be an issue in any, everything, that, everything that we do. So the sorts of things where this becomes important is, for instance, I was really pleased when I received an email from somebody who was organising our prestigious biology open lectures, asking for names of people to come and lecture, and at the bottom of the email it said, please don't forget that we need to get lots of women coming as well as men. So I just thought, great, because they've already said, don't, don't just send all the names of your the male colleagues that you know, but do it, and I thought... That was good, and we do make sure that our seminar speakers are 50-50 men and, men and women. And again, that was an interesting discussion to have. Should it be 50-50 or not? But anyway, that's where we, that's where we went. Um, so we've done quite a lot about um, addressing women at key career stages. So I think everybody now is doing unconscious bias training. Um, we make sure that we always have a reasonable gender balance in, on all interview panels. So... Um, and that includes for postdoc and for PhD uh, interviews as well. We've trained up some of our postdocs so we can have some postdocs sitting in on those if we're short of one of the genders. Um, we had a discussion about what we do if we get a single gender shortlist. And the last time I happened to be on an appointment and we ended up with a single gender shortlist, somebody on the panel said, you do realise that this has now become a single gender shortlist, do you? and nobody had, so we said, okay, right, let's go to the gender that's not represented and find the best one and compare that against the worst one on our shortlist. And we did that and we swapped. And, that was, and everybody was very happy with that. And when I went round afterwards and asked about, nobody, nobody said that person was only invited to make up the numbers, weren't they? No, nobody spotted it because I sort of said, do you think any of these candidates was particularly weak? And, and nobody, nobody said that at all, which shows perhaps that we weren't very good at drawing up our shortlist. Um, and we do lots of mentoring, but the university has also started doing lots of coaching as well, so we make sure that we don't overlap with what the university is offering. We don't want to be um, doing too much of the same thing. Um, what else have we done? Um, more, thinking much more about our department and how we... Uh, organise in our culture. So we're wanting to build up a group of biology, um, northern biologists who talk much more about issues to do with biology. I think it's good to talk across different science subjects and also of course to widen it into the non-STEM subjects but I think there are very specific issues to do with biology that it would be very good to talk with other people about. So one of the things I'm quite interested in as a biologist who's an ecologist who does field work is issues to do of safety of women working in the field. And that's something, I don't know if people read around it, but that's something that's been picked up quite a lot. There's quite a lot of discussion about it at the moment. And of course, if you're a woman in the field who feels vulnerable doing field work, perhaps away from the UK in a, in a tropical environment, where a lot of my students go, then that might be enough to put you off uh, if uh, there was some uh, uh, awful experience where you felt vulnerable in the field. And like a lot of places, we're thinking about compiling a history of female scientists in the department to raise a profile. In fact, that might be the first thing we do that's just female, maybe. Anyway. Okay, so that's where we've got to in 50 years. <laughs> so it's really slow. Um, I don't know if anybody who's heard Paul Walton from the chemistry department talk, and he also shows how slow this is for how many decades it's going to take to get to some sort of quality. So about three, per, sorry, three times increase over 50 years. So it's really, really, really slow. But anyway, <laughs> that's, what, that's the sort of progress uh, that we've made. But when I look around the department, um, it is quite interesting to see that we do have, a, because we have this 30% uh, of our... our um, Academics are females. We've got females in quite senior positions as well. 
So um, that was just to show that we have a banner as well, the picture on the, on the right, as, as you do. And on the left is our, our notice board that you get when you come into our department to see who are the people in the department. So top left is Ian Graham, our head of department, and then these are the key and managerial positions within the department. And I've just highlighted which, one of those, which ones of those are women, and there's about half of them that are. So I think we're quite unusual to have our director of infrastructure to be female. It's quite an unusual one to be female, I think. Um, and perhaps also a finance advisor, maybe, is quite unusual to be female. Um, uh, and then, of course, very often what you do see is that women have senior roles, but very often they're in, that they're in I don't mean to be rude about this, but they're not in the really proper committees, if you like, not the ones that hold real power. But clearly the research committee does, so we have a female chair of that and also our chair of our graduate school. So it's not just that they're taking up some of the more uh, soft roles, if you, if you like. So, so, that's, so I think that's a good, good thing um, um, in terms of having females in senior positions. So just finishing off with some do's and don'ts, and this is very specifically about thinking about moving forward to Athena Swan, so I don't know how, whether this is any useful or not, or whether this is too specific for you. Um, so what have I found? Don't leave it to one person. Uh, and I know the number of women who say, I can't believe how bad Athena Swan has been for my productivity because it's kept me busy for months, and it shouldn't be like that. It's not fair. Uh, we had, the data are just so difficult to collect. It takes ages. Um, and I think... So a lot of people expect really rapid changes. If they just think if only we change a few things, everything is going to be fine. And that, that doesn't, in our experience, that doesn't seem to be true. But there are some fairly quick, quick wins. And I don't think you should assume everybody's going to be supportive. Um, and, and I would say I, I think that's an important discussion to be had because if people aren't supportive, then we need to be thinking about how to get people on board. Um, and I don't think you should assume that HR is going to take charge. Um, we've worked very well with HR, working together. So. Uh, and that's been a very positive and great relationship to move things forward. But I don't think it's an HR, always an HR issue. And I don't think you should give up. But you do feel like giving up quite a lot. Uh, and so what we have done is we have to keep everybody involved and let people know what we're doing. So there has been an element of top-down decision that we've seen things that are wrong, we've decided to change them. But usually we've had that discussion before we've changed them um, and then gone ahead and changed them perhaps altered it slightly, but let people know why we're doing it. We have made great use of other people's great ideas, so we're quite happy to, to share our great ideas with people to use them, and we've also quite happily plagiarised other people's ideas. And having another gold department in the university has been great, so we sit on the chemistry Athena committee and they sit on ours, so we, we share lots of ideas, including sharing documents and sharing very specific things about say, if they update their maternity processes, then we ask for a copy, and so on and so forth. Uh, so very specifically, if you're thinking about doing a theme of Swan sitting on a judging panel, it's very good. You can find out what, uh, what, what they want. Um, and as I say, getting everybody to do a bit of everything means that um, um, by delegation, a lot, lots of the responsibility can be sp spread out and a lot more people can get, get, get involved. Um, we try not to do too much at once, we just do a few things and really make sure we do those things well rather than be super enthusiastic and not really managing to achieve anything at all. Um, I do think you can get slow and steady progress if you stick, stick at it um, and keep, keep, uh, keep going. So that's what we have about fostering supportive culture to help all staff and students reach their full potential, which is essentially what Athena is about, it's about fairness. And I think everybody can, who would not sign up to that? <laughs> so I think when we go back to that, and let us say that's what we have on our uh, bookmarks, and that we've, we've, we've made it very clear that, that we're not doing things just for women, but, but those that women are who are, are um, suffering from bad practices. 